pleased to have uh, Lydia Padilla here, uh, most of you by now are probably uh, fully aware of why she's here and uh, some of the circumstances surrounding her visit. She's probably the best known uh, advocate around the world for the rights of the Uyghur people of Western China. And she's also the subject, of course, of the film The Ten Conditions of Love, which has been featuring at the uh, Melbourne International Film Festival. Uh, she visited Australia for that premiere and uh, to also raise awareness of the Uyghur people's issues in Australia. Ms. Kadir's uh, advocacy for those people originally began within the official Chinese system, but uh, that ended rather abruptly in 1997. Two years later, she was uh, in prison uh, and was released early on the eve of a visit by the US Secretary of State, which might have had something to do with it. And of course, she now lives in Washington. Uh, but we're very pleased that she's been able to find time for this event today. And I hope you'll join me in welcoming her to the National Press Club. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's my honor to be here with you this afternoon. Uh, and uh, first of all, I would like to express my deep appreciation to the National Press Club for resisting Chinese pressure and for allowing me to speak today uh, about the long suffering of the Uyghur people under China's brutal rule. And I would like to also appreciate all the reporters who are here with us who want to cover uh, my speech. Uh, I want to state that I'm not the enemy of the Chinese state, and uh, I'm just a seeker of freedom and uh, democracy and human rights for my people. And uh, the situation of the Uyghur people is very similar to the situation of the Tibetans. We suffer the same suffering under the same government. And, uh, but it has been a long while that the Uyghur people have not been able to raise our voice in the world as much as our Tibetan brothers did. Now for Uyghurs, now, uh, they have three options to live under Chinese rule today. For Uyghurs to live under Chinese rule is, one is prison, another is exile, another is eat three meals a day and submit absolutely to the will of the Chinese government. And for those Uyghurs who speak out against Chinese government's repression against their fellow Uyghur people, uh, they're arrested, imprisoned, in many cases executed in uh, closed show trials, uh, which has no due process at all. And as a result of six decades of heavy-handed Chinese repression of the Uyghur people, then we saw an 
July the 5th, the Uyghur people took the streets to protest against Chinese rule. And uh, we know for a fact that the Chinese government issued a DVD and sent to all over uh, the world, including here, to basically confirm their version of the story to blame everything on us. And it's interesting the way the Chinese government described, described me in the past now attack me because right now the Chinese government consider me as like a terrorist or separatist or one of the worst kind of people in, in China. But in the 1990s, the Chinese government praised me as one of their best and also said I was a good entrepreneur and did everything to improve the lives of many people there. And uh, in fact, I have, I have a prepared state, a statement in English, uh, which will be read by me. And uh, so after that, uh, I'd, I'd love to take questions from all of you. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Before we begin, I would like to thank the organizers of this event. I'd also like to thank everyone here today for your kind attendance. Uh, the time has come for the People's Republic of China to fundamentally reform its policies toward the non-Han Chinese people within its borders. If he have learned one thing from the unrest in Urumqi this July and in Tibet in March 2008, it is that the Chinese government is out of policy ideas in addressing the increasing marginalization of non-Han Chinese people in China, besides endless runs of crackdowns and strike hard campaigns. It's time for the Chinese government to sit and to talk with me and the Dalai Lama and all those leaders of non-Chinese communities who have been vilified, imprisoned, and slandered just because we happen to disagree with the bankrupt official Chinese government policy. In 1979, the Chinese government made a bold move and began a process of economic reform, which helped maintain its grip on near-absolute power. The Chinese government now needs to make an even bolder move and enact political reform toward all people in the PRC, but especially toward non-Chinese people who have largely missed out on the benefits of economic reform to maintain any semblance of credibility beyond its status as the world's creditor. This call for political reform toward non-Chinese people also has the support of the Chinese, signatories of Charter 8, a manifesto for political reform drafted by prominent and ordinary Chinese citizens asked from the government for an institutional design to promote the mutual prospects of all ethnicities. In addition, Wang Yang, a top Chinese Communist Party official in Guangdong province, has stressed the need for adjustments to the Chinese government's policies toward non-Chinese people and added that if this process was not carried out, then there will be some problems. In order for any future political reform process to have validity, the Chinese government must engage in a genuine and transparent dialogue with non-Chinese people built on a foundation of trust and equality. Mao Zedong said that political power comes, out of, comes from the barrel of the gun, but I say that political reform comes from the table of peaceful negotiation. However, the promise of dialogue between the Chinese government and the Uyghur people, based on the principles of trust and equality, looks ever more distant as the Chinese government continues in its devices in, divisive infective against the Uyghur people since unrest in Urumqi. The dismissal by the Chinese authorities in its statements, whether by officials or by the state media, of the fact that true discontent exists uh, with its policies in East Turkestan means that it cannot and will not build a trust with the Uyghur people. Building trust with the Uyghur people also stems from telling the truth 
about the events in Shaoguan and in Urumqi. But the Chinese government has decided against doing this. A serious incident in Shaoguan, which brought Uyghur protesters to the streets of Urumqi on July the 5th, was far more serious than the Chinese government is suggesting. The truth about the unrest in Urumqi following the protest organized by Uyghurs is an altogether a different matter. While the Shaoguan incident illustrates that the Chinese authorities were unwilling to protect Uyghurs from a civilian mob intent on killing, the Urumqi unrest, on the other hand, illustrates that the Chinese authorities were willing to unlawfully and disproportionately kill Uyghur protesters and then obscure the truth about those killings. In a UK Guardian newspaper, Jonathan Watts... On the eve of a visit by the US Secretary of State, which might have had something to do with it, and of course he now lives in Washington. Uh, but we're very pleased that this, he's been able to find time for this event today. And I'm very pleased to have Padilla uh, here. Uh, most of you by now are probably uh, fully aware of why she's here and uh, some of the circumstances surrounding her visit. She's probably the best known uh, advocate, I assume visited Australia for that premiere and uh, to also raise awareness of the Uyghur people's issues in Australia. Ms. Kadir's uh, advocacy for those people originally began around the world for the rights of the Uyghur people of Western China and she's also the subject of course of the film The Ten Conditions of Love which has been featuring at the uh, Melbourne International Film Festival again within the official Chinese system but uh, that ended rather abruptly in 1997. Two years later, she was uh, in prison uh, and was released early 